Oh man, this is gonna be a long one. But I've been meaning to talk about this game for a super long time since it came out. Grab your goods folks, this is gonna be a special one. There's been a little uprising in games being made in the Doom engine as of late. A lot of these are really cool. It's like a renaissance because there was a period where games used to be made in the Doom engine, you know, like Heretic, Hexen, Strife, Chex, you know. And this is like the modern version of this event. Except these games have been in the work for years because there's usually only one dev. Oh, my bad. GZ Doom Engine. Sorry, but the OG Doom Engine isn't doing any of this. Well, hey, I still feel at home with this. So where does this plant us? Well, let me tell you about a game that took me on an emotional roller coaster. An FPS in the GZ Doom Engine that everyone is too afraid to talk about. One that left me feeling an emotion I would never imagine. I need to tell you about Memoirs of Magic. Alright, so let's drop the fact that this was made in the Doom Engine, because this is very much its own beast. This is like something you'd find on the Nintendo 64, or PS1, DOS, it's kind of nostalgic in that way, like, like going to a game shop and you'd see, whoa, a random FPS RPG game from the 90s. Let's play this, man. Released in 2019 by Strawberry Octi. Apparently developed back in 2015, 2016, he said it took him three years. Regardless, I've been following this game for a while, and I was so hyped when it came out. So let's look at what we got. In the magical world of magic, where magic exists known as the magic world, peace and prosperity was brought by the royal essay family, which isn't true because these two exist, but you got it man. One day, an evil dickhead came out of nowhere, and so they called forth brave warriors in order to stop this guy. I don't know how these people brought peace and prosperity when all they do is just sit on their throne in the face of danger. This isn't even a throne room, it's just two chairs randomly placed in the corridors. It's like if I put a chair in the middle of a mall and called myself a monarch. Who put these two in charge? So like any good RPG plot, you have to explore the world in order to collect the different elemental hearts. I'm serious, this is my favorite kind of plot for an RPG. Cause it gives you an excuse to go out and explore the world. You get varied in cool environments, it's great. Anyways, so you get to play as one of the seven different warriors that was called. Each character has their own attributes, special abilities, and starting weapons. Lucian Voyager, Phazar Bluetail, William Slay the Third, which let's be real, it's a pretty dope name. Prince Bara, Dus, Gramiel Hotshot, Sandro Doom, which let's be real, it's a pretty cool name, and Leo Howe. I know you may not believe me, but each character plays this game significantly differently. Dialogue, quests, how you even approach the game change depending on who you pick. More on this later. The characters all represent one of the six elements. Grameel is fire, Phazar is ice, Spartus is air, William is earth, Lucian is light, and Xandro is dark. But spacey, there's seven characters and only six elements. Yes, because one of these dudes don't play by the same rule. We'll get to Leo, man. So coming in for the first time, who did I choose? Completely blind, without knowledge of anything. I chose Grameel. Why? Well, one, I'm into short stacks. I mean, one, he's got a pistol. Two, he's got a rocket launcher. And that's definitely a me kind of setup. He's also got a flamethrower, but... <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? I also chose him because he had a high agility stat, so I figured that mean I'd be zooming around with the pistols and it'd be great. What a god awful mistake that was. So after the lore drop, you're dropped into the castle, and if you're new you'll find that there isn't really too much to do here. I mean there's a lot of tutorials you can read, but you can also just skip them entirely and get lost for hours. Maybe you'll find out you can cook these hams on here, and if me, you'll realize that you've already nearly lost half your life. Going outside, you get to what is basically the hub area, the City of Magic. 
and I'm probably going to say this a lot, but this game has such a cool style, man. Yeah, Spacey doesn't hate 3D models, and that's what this game is. I mean, Doom had 3D models technically, they were just photographed into sprites. This is different though, because while some of these models are turned into sprites, location areas and bosses are full on 3D models, their movements look so smooth. And it's such a unique and cool look at that, and it's bright and colorful, that's the big thing, it's a style, man. I can look at a screenshot and identify this game immediately. Like, I don't really care about good graphics in games, but the graphics really attracted me to this game. I really like the glove aesthetic too with the weapons, it's just so, so cool. Trust me, I'm about it, gloves are cool, man. Anyways, at the moment, the City of Magic doesn't have much to do. The Coliseum doesn't have anything yet, Magical Emporium is empty, the bank is kind of pointless if you're playing single player, because you lose your money when you die in multiplayer, but in single player you just reload the last save. However, your money does get interest, but only if you're playing as Baradis. I'm telling you, this game has a lot of small character differences like that, that changes how you play. It's really cool. The museum isn't useful yet. You can visit the tavern to refill your HP and MP, and also talk to the other characters you didn't choose. When you're done with the City of Magic, you get to explore the insanely large force maze, which is what connects to all the other main areas in the game. I mean, this is... it's pretty large. The best you have are these sign things, but they aren't really helpful because you don't really know what they mean. So you just wander around and get curb stomped by these bandits until you go somewhere. It's actually pretty open considering you can go anywhere you want from this point of the game. Now would be a good time to go over how the weapons work. There are three types of weapons, Signature, Alchemy, and Magic. Signature is the character specific weapon you start with, in this case Grimil's pistol. These have infinite ammo unless if you're Sandro, and a lot of them end up being melee. Alchemy weapons are basically just guns, sporting alternative ammo and alt fires. Magic weapons are these tomes that have an attack and also let you charge up different spells. There's an alchemy and magic weapon for every element. For example, the fire alchemy weapon is the rocket launcher, and the fire magic weapon is this flamethrower book that also sets mines and can give you haste, and can summon a dragon. These books do a lot. Ammo-wise, it kind of works like the green and blue magic from Hexen. AP is for alchemy weapons and MP is for magic, they're even color coded as green and blue. Defeating most enemies will cause them to drop nitro gel, death caps, and mandragores. These refill AP, MP, and HP respectively. It honestly makes fighting a lot of these random encounters worth it. Same with gold. For most characters, these items are just nice small heals, but for some characters they can actually craft with these things. Like Ramil can make special ammo types with his reloading tool. Jill Valentine would be proud, man. So hopefully you made it to the graveyard by now, it's here you'll find out that this game actually has some puzzles, quite a number of them really and they're pretty good for the most part, but more importantly you'll come across your first forced combat encounter, and it's here, you will die, and die, and die, and die, and if you're playing Grameel like me, you will die in likely one hit. This is a hard game. A very hard game. I was not ready for this. After a rather demoralizing forced maze segment and another fight segment, you will realize by then that you are in for a wild ride. You are on Octi's ride now. By now you've probably been poisoned, which quickly drains your health, and if you're playing as Grameel or Xandro, this is a one shot. It was by then I realized that Grameel's weapons are kinda trash. Partly because his strength stat sucks, but also because for being a hot shot sharpshooter, he's not very accurate. The pistol is weak and the recoil is kind of whack, and this rocket launcher has the worst accuracy. Just kidding, I just found out mid script that the crosshair doesn't line up. Look at this, I thought that for the longest time that the rocket launcher had crazy spread, but it was just a garbage crosshair. So I just had to rely on my mind, which is the first spell you get from the fire spell book, which ended up killing me a lot. Grimmel in general is just hard to control, he's too fast and he has moon jumps. It was by this point I began to sweat a bit, like, <laughs> this game is kind of painful. But shut up past Spacey, look, Bee Kingdom, oh sweet bees! By now you've probably found one of these laughing marble statues too. These can be found in plenty of different secret areas, there are like 88 of these. Defeating them will give you a statue that you can bring to the museum to get a money reward and a cool statue set up here in the viewing room. This is really good and encourages you to find secrets. So what's the point of gold? 
Well, in every town you can access the Magic Emporium and meet one of the Boulevard family members. These guys are cool. These are the shops. But they also open up fast travel routes back to the City of Magic. If we're talking RPGs in the most standard way, you can think gold as XP because you can use that here to purchase stat upgrades. Oh yeah, I guess I should talk about the stats. Strength affects the damage with all weapons, intelligence affects your maximum AP and MP, defense increases your maximum health. What's cool is that increasing these values increases the amount each attribute is healed from potions as well. Finally, agility. This affects your speed and jump height. Grimmiel has the highest amount, and uh, I feel like without having the proper build up, you know, starting with lower agility and building up, I think that's why he's very hard to control for a newcomer. Also, by the end of the game, I'd arguably say agility is the most important stat, but I'll get to why later. I know this might make it seem like starting stats aren't that important, but they are, because every time you purchase a stat upgrade, it costs more to upgrade it again. If that isn't enough, this is money. And you aren't just buying stat upgrades, you have to buy health, ammo, mana restores, or what about buying alternate ammo types, what about buying other weapons? You can't obtain other signature weapons, but you can buy all the other alchemy and magic weapons. But that's not it, buying a weapon you already own upgrades that weapon. And this isn't just the damage upgrade, you get alt fires, differences with the normal attack. With magic you get a new spell, you will never have too much money in this game. And that's why going out and finding secrets and doing other side content is important because it's worth your time. So buy the Earth Tome. I'm serious. On my first playthrough, I did not. This book lets you spawn healing apples and shoot piercing shards. It's awesome and it's basically a requirement. Anyways, after which you'll find yourself in a dungeon. There's some mad Zelda inspiration going on here. Also in the case of me being lost. The dungeons are the only places that need to be done in order, which is a good idea because there is a difficulty curve here, with the starting difficulty being very hard. God, these enemies came straight from hell! These teleporting wizards keep one-shotting me! God, these golems are insane, I can't dodge their attack! Bro, there's like 80 snakes here, and they poison me, so if a single one attacks me, I'm dead. What the hell do I do in this room, man? Is there supposed to be a puzzle here, or am I just taking damage? Whoa, this boss is really cool, but I'm out of ammo, so I just have to blast away with this pistol? Well, that was hell. Anyway, it's time to dick around until I can find where I'm supposed to go again. What's that? I have to go to the Arctic Mountains? Alright, I'll just follow the blue flags then, because blue equals ice, am I right? Well, this isn't a mountain. So anyways, you head down this ice path where you get destroyed by machine gun skeletons and slowed down by ice golems, which I still can't dodge their attacks. This part here came straight from hell. I can't believe this. When people tell you to bind a quick save key for this game, they mean for stuff like this. Ice skate city with skeletons machine gunning you and rolling across the screen. Hot tip, go to the options and lower the damage fade, because getting hit once in this game is like getting inflicted with a blind debuff. It was at this point that I was so frustrated that I decided to restart because I really wanted to like this game. Characters are not created equally in Memoirs of Magic. Grimiel baited me with his cute looks, but he was hard mode. So who did I choose for my true first time playthrough? Phazar. Why? One, he has high strength and defense, unlike Grimiel. Two, he has a one-handed double-barreled shotgun. And if you remember what I said in my Lizard Squad video, I'm always a sucker for a one-handed double-barreled shotgun weapon. I could play through a whole megawad with this weapon and not get bored. Anyways, Phazar's signature weapon is an axe. It's kind of sucky at first, but freezing with the book it makes it useful. And the ice statues and the shotgun are also pretty cool. His special ability is this Berserker Rage Mode that gives him health and MP regen and later on turns him into an absolute monster. Now this is a beginner's character. So this time I did make it to the next dungeon and it was this fire dungeon it was really cool. This bomb jumping stuff is a great idea and the platforming in this game is just really nice to begin with. You have a lot of air control with your jumps and you have this kick attack that functions as a double jump which really lets you get your footing. This game has some cool dungeon designs, man. Every dungeon is different from each other. I'm not going to be throwing bombs at walls and trying to find hidden mithril in any other dungeons. 
Speaking of which, I even did a side quest which let me upgrade my signature weapon. I can now shoot out these disc things that do insane damage. Hey, this is kind of fun! Even if I'm still getting destroyed, like that second phase of the fire boss, I don't know what the hell that was. It was something, alright. Anyways, now I gotta go find the water dungeon. I probably should have gone here way earlier to upgrade my shotgun now that I think about it. While I was here, I had the wrong idea on where to go, and I thought I was supposed to travel with the boat with this cutie to this desert place. Traveling here was actually kind of fun, it's like a coordinates thing with the movement, where different X and Y coordinates lead to different places, and you see people that give their own tips on where you should go. Everything was fun except for the combat sections. God, these puppet enemies suck! Along with these Octopunk guys, they just rise up from the ground and blast me before I can do anything, that's cheap! But everything else is really cool. You get told the coordinates to this neon city with alcohol and slot machines and this dude known as the Dark Lord. I like this man, I can vibe with him. But on the other hand, you also find this spaceship. This is the only town like area with its own theme and it's such a cool environment. And you find out that this Empress person and the Dark Lord have been fighting for a while now. Yeah man, you two are really keeping up the peace and prosperity, huh? And it's also here you get one of the coolest weapons this satellite gun it's the light alchemy weapon and you basically put down a signal for a beam of light to strike down but the beam of light is coming from the ship so you're putting the signal down and it's like you're commanding the ship to shoot the light there i love that it's such a cool idea due to that you actually can't use it on inside areas which means it's kind of useless because most of the dungeons are on the inside but it does have a decent alternate charge fire i'll be honest when it comes to the doom engine these are definitely the coolest and most unique weapons I've ever messed with. And it's not just for how they function, but it's for how they mess with the mechanics. Like fire slaps up ice enemies, ice lets you create platforms out of lava and water, electric attacks shock water, god it's just so cool. Anyways, digging around the desert I even managed to come across an optional boss. So basically every element has a dragon associated with it. These are like optional super bosses. Beating these dudes allow you to get max level for your weapons of that element, alongside summoning them and playing as them in battle. Whoa, this is cool. This is the point of SP, summon points. Although I didn't actually use these guys a lot, because when you die with them, the game glitches out and you become like a ghost and you can't do anything. This happens when you die in multiplayer sometimes too. I think it can be fixed by exiting the area, but a lot of the time I used the dragons in arenas where I couldn't exit. So I just didn't really bother using them. Also screw that Mal fight, Jesus it's just Ice Skate City. But with that in mind, Mal's a cutie and I love him. So I figured out by now I probably shouldn't be in the desert, which led me on the right track. After getting jumped by Octopunks and crying for years, I turned on the lighthouse, which made a submarine rise from the ocean for some reason. Cool. Also for some reason, this part lagged my game extremely. I'll admit, I had to use the freeze cheat code in the console just to save my frame rate. I know my computer isn't strong in the slightest, but this was the only part of the game that hit me bad. I guess it was the light effect loading in, or maybe it was the submarine, or maybe all this combined with the fact that these maps are kinda gigantic. Well well, here we are at the water dungeon, and if there is anything to compare Zelda to when it comes to memoirs of magic, it's a nightmarish water dungeon. Dear god, I never look forward to coming here. You get dragged around by water currents, drown, spike balls, oh god, make it stop. I mean, yeah, it's still original from all the other dungeons, but man, I am not having fun here. And then, I reached here. This single frame broke me. This is a switch puzzle. And the puzzle is that there is a water tunnel with different open and closed doors. And you have to find out the right switch combination for the right path. So you send one player down there to relay information to the player messing with the switches. What? You're playing single player? Sucks to be you, man. It's trial and error time. What's worse is that if you reload the save, the switches glitch out and you can't even tell what's up and what's down anymore. I was at my wit's end at this part of the game. To the point where I dropped it. I concluded that Memoirs of Magic was a multiplayer game with a single player mode. That I wasn't playing the game correctly as intended. That I was missing out. The insane difficulty. The way classes complement each other. To having a drop gold item that does nothing for you in single player. I just feel like it was expected to be playing multiplayer. 
and it's not like I had anyone to play this with. I haven't commented on this yet, but I mean, I can't imagine playing with a normie friend and we have to sit around and witness stuff like this. I don't actually know how normal people would feel about this kind of furry stuff, I mean, I'm the one with the fur affinity account here. And to be totally honest, I love these character designs. These are extremely appealing to me, and far the reason why I played Bomb to begin with. If these designs weird you out, then I think you understand how I feel about generic human anime designs. We just see the world differently, man, and you're a boring person. <laughs> Regardless, where am I going to find a furry, or someone with an open mind, that also happens to be godlike at Doom because this game is still really hard in multiplayer, so I said screw it, I'll take a break. I told myself I'd get back to it after my video on Golden Souls. Now, here's the thing. My Golden Souls video came out four months ago. So what happened? I became afraid of memoirs of magic. Seriously, I didn't want to touch this game. I didn't want to get frustrated again. But I did want to get back to it because I said I would back in my Hexen video. I made a promise and I was going to pull through. Man. This part of the video was hard to write, because it was hard to remember how I felt on my first playthrough of Memoirs of Magic, especially considering how I feel about Memoirs of Magic now. <laughs> finally, this is the part of the video I have been waiting for, I can finally stop being so negative. I just wanted to capture my anger this game first made me feel. So I did come back to this game, I finished the water dungeon. And it was all uphill from here. I was still annoyed at some of these weird gimmicks and puzzles, but dude, there's workarounds. I don't feel like learning this dumb poison path puzzle, so I'll just use this high jump book and skip it. Then I went to this pyramid dungeon that had this really novel mechanic of switching between light and dark. Though I'll be honest, it was kind of hard to see when it was dark, but hey, shut up Spacey, there was a lot of cool puzzles with this. And the boss here might just be my favorite one. The bosses in Memoirs of Magic are the highlight, to the point where I don't want to spoil them. It was when I realized that Strawberry Octi is really good at game design, man. The design in terms of learning how to beat them and how their attacks can be anticipated thanks to the animation, just wow. I was exploring around, backtracking, and finding cool items like this ring that gives me a health regen. I was finding all sorts of secrets. It was then I realized that before, I was playing the game wrong. I just stuck to the shotgun like I was playing Doom. But I began to learn the power of other weapons, of experimentation. These Octopunk enemies actually aren't hard at all, I just have to freeze them when they come out of the ground. I typically don't like chain guns, but I tried this one and it's actually awesome and fun. I trashed on the flamethrower at first, but hey, it's good for these clusters of cloud enemies. And this rocket launcher is actually great with the homing alternate fire. Remember how I said I couldn't dodge the golem's attacks? Look at it. Look at how the fists shoot out. Wow, it's purposely designed to punish players that just circle strafe. That is genius. Strawberry Octi is a god gamer. This genius kind of design is all over the game. This is why I said I didn't want to bring up the Doom engine, because this is far more impressive than anything I've ever seen done in this engine. And coming from me, that does mean something. The finale to this game is incredible too, I'm not even going to show it, especially the music. There may not be many songs, but man are they jams. You already know how I feel about the Dark Steiner theme, but finale is incredible. I love the town theme too, and the forest one. I beat this game, and I felt awestruck. Absolutely amazed by what I just played, it was magical. There's just so much to do in this game too, side quests and secrets to get cool items that even change the ending somewhat. These crazy rings that have extreme upsides and downsides. After beating the game, I went to the official discord and I found this giant google doc full of information. It even has a section to help new players out that I think is really good. Although to be honest, I shouldn't have to join the discord and read a google doc just to be able to suitably play your game man. But still, this game made me feel really good. So much so, that I just straight up started a second playthrough. This time it's Xandro. I know what you're thinking. Spacey, isn't it boring to just play the same game again? Completely incorrect. Once again, every character plays this game differently. Xandro can craft potions out of materials that enemies drop, even being able to craft potions that you can't get anywhere else. This changed the game for me. 
I even started to use this ring that gave me more crafting drops at the cost of less money. It was just ideal for how I wanted to play Sandro. And Sandro's signature weapon? The orbs? Oh my god, what a cool weapon! You can switch between the different elements, and while you may not understand their uses at first, once you do and you start switching through them, man, it's a blast. I'm not really about the dark magic weapons, I think they're pretty boring, but the spell that turns enemies into pigs is super useful because I have a food source now. I was using fire orbs on oil puddles in order to cook the food that I was getting from the polymorph spell. Bro, I wasn't doing any of this with Phazar, and now with more knowledge, I'd say the second playthrough was just as fun, because I knew where I could go and I knew where things were. I even found out this sacred speedrun tech that lets me do the super jump, farther cementing that Grimmile is useless. What a blast. Though if you really want to put a spin on your second playthrough, play Leo. Leo's like the perfect second playthrough character. He doesn't use guns like everyone else, instead has these melee combo inputs that can do different attacks and even level up over time. I feel like he's the kind of character that you would unlock after you beat the game. But man, the way every character plays different, all the cool details like the HUD filling up with water to show that you're drowning, to the different dialogue and quests the different characters get, it's impressive. Quick spoiler alert because there is something I really want to talk about. So remember the ship with the light impress? Well if you're playing as Xandro, you get a quest for your level 3 signature weapon by the Dark Lord, tasking you to go to the ship. And because you're a demon, same with Grameel, they straight up start attacking you when you enter. Wow, what a bunch of racists! Lucian, do you really side with these guys? It becomes this crazy standoff as you fight your way through the ship with enemies that you only ever fight here. This is so cool! And after escaping, the ship is destroyed, and suddenly the satellite weapon that calls upon the ship to bring the light? Guess what, it no longer works now. That is such a cool detail, man. Though you gotta be careful, because there's actually a way to explore the ship with Grameel and Xandro, and you need to do it for 100% because you can miss out on the light shop completely. You can even destroy the ship as other characters too, and even attack town NPCs too. They have special attacks that you would only see from attacking them. It's details like this that makes me realize how much appreciation and love went into this game. What a great game, man. I still have my problems with it of course, the weird glitches, the fact that if your agility isn't high enough you basically get stack gated so make sure you upgrade it a lot, but it's also weird because if you upgrade it too much you could become uncontrollable. I also don't like how the inventory system is, GC Doom's inventory system has always been pretty cumbersome, mods that tend to have a lot of items usually have specific hotkeys you can set to specific items, Memoir doesn't have that, and I find having to cycle around to refill your HP, MP, AP all in the middle of battle with all the items completely split from each other to be kind of frustrating, like I'm spending more of my time looking at my items in my inventory than the enemies I'm supposed to be shooting. Like not all this needs to be inventory items. Drop gold is useless in single player, you really could have just made a button to bring up this data page I never bothered with. The statues clog things up too, and useless crap like the cigarettes. I mean these aren't bad because you can just get rid of those, but still. This applies to weapons as well, but it's not as bad because you can just use the number keys to swap through the weapons. But there are multiple weapons set on the same key, so that still blows. Because we're talking about GZ Doom, multiplayer is hell. Like, you should be thankful because this may be the only footage of multiplayer you will ever see of this game, and it's just me playing with myself. I had to use the launcher to get it set up, so things like the crosshair looked all glitched, along with a number of other flags. You aren't supposed to launch this game through GZ Doom with an iWOD, you launch it with its own executable. I already discussed some of the weird glitches in multiplayer. But I guess one benefit of using a launcher is that you can play through with other random Doom mods and come to the realization that the normal Doom speed is really slow and that any of these dudes could probably beat the hell out of the Doom guy. Shouts to the dude I saw trying to play Hideous Destructor with Memoirs of Magic, what a legend. But yeah, I really recommend you give Memoirs of Magic a try. Just get the quick save button ready. It really is incredible, and it's depressing to see people glossing over it. Is it the difficulty? Maybe it's the character designs? Y'all retro FPS reviewers can talk about Doom games with hot monster titty girls, but you can't handle giant buff dragon dudes and tights? You absolutely hate to see the fragile masculinity. This is a special game, man. A gem. Part of me actually feels like speedrunning the game, but maybe the Gorgon Ring would ruin the run. No Gorgon Ring percent. So after releasing this amazing project, what does Strawberry Octi do? Take a break and chill from making games? Hell no, he's already making another game. 
and it's still cool and stylish. It's more of a 3D beat em up, like a character action game, which isn't really too much of my forte, but after playing Memoirs of Magic and, and seeing a fellow game dev and how they design a game, I want to play this. I think it may also be a continuation of the plot for Memoirs, and I'm kind of interested in learning more about the world. And guess who one of the main characters are? It's Mal, man. Now I'm not saying I'm Mal's number one fan or anything, but if he had an OnlyFans- Hey Spacey, get on with the video, it's too long! Man, I remember when I said I'd make my videos shorter. I'm gonna have Octi's Twitter and Patreon in the links below. Support this man. I'm convinced Memoirs of Magic isn't his first game, but according to him, it is. Imagine hitting it out of the park with your first swing. I can't really think of any more to say about this game. I mean, uh... One of the enemies will be in Pizza Tower, that's pretty cool. Uh, Dracul's pretty cute too. Well, if I can say one thing about Memoirs, is that it's inspiring. Maybe this is why I play any games like this. I really feel the compassion and love that go into these things. It fills me up to do the same thing. Good stuff to Strawberry Octi and everyone else who worked on this game. That's that for that. I hope you like my memoir on this magical game.